This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. All right, welcome into another edition of Three Maw. I am John Kurtz, and it is me flying solo today without the rest of the Three Maw crew. But uh, good news, rest assured, you don't have to listen to me the whole time. We have A State Director of Athletics, Gene Taylor, uh, joining me on the show today. Very, very excited about that. And you know what that means? It calls for a toast from our friends at Holiday Distillery. Make sure you get out there and get their Ben Holiday bottled in Bond Bourbon. Cole, I heard him telling the story earlier about uh, some of his friends that just recently tried it, that he considers bourbon experts that love it. Uh, we continue to hear that from anybody who tries it. You can also get their 360 vodka. They've got something for everybody. But make sure you're stocked up for the lake. And, hey, football season, not that far away. I think we're under 70 days, uh, so never too early to stock up for your tailgates as well. Very true. Yeah, Gene, we appreciate you uh, making some time here on the show. I was kind of joking with you before we came on. Like, I, I don't know. I can't imagine that it's ever an easy time to be an athletic director, but like right now with everything going on, like I, I, what what is life like right now as a as a Division One Power Five AD? <laughs> well, you know it's funny, John. Hey, first of all, it's been a while, so it's good to be on and good to see you and good to catch up a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, it's funny. You know, I, you know, we obviously had a great baseball run here at the end, and you're sitting there at the baseball park and you're watching these players just compete at a high level and. You know, you see them have great victories. You, you see them have tough losses. And that's all feels the same, right? I mean, that's what college athletics is about. And, you know, watching the College World Series this weekend, all oh, this week, it's been fun. It's some great games. And if you immer- immerse yourself into that, that's that's the fun part. And that's the enjoyable part. You know, then you go to your national convention, which we just did a few a couple of weeks ago, and you, you start to work through the details of what we're facing, and it begins to get a little uncertainty. Um, and, and sometimes a little, you know, scary, I don't know if scary is the right word, but just how did we get here? Um, you know, a lot of people looking for answers again, particularly all around the lawsuit and the settlement of the lawsuit and, you know, how we're going to do it and, and what, what does it mean? And, you know, those are some challenges that none of us have faced and it, it begins to get a little, little, um, you know, uncertain for sure. Well, I definitely do want to talk plenty about that i figured we could start with some of the more fun yeah. stuff, like <laughs> like baseball which you just mentioned i mean pete hughes and those guys they've been so close multiple times to the ncaa tournament they break through they get to a regional they become only the second team in school history to ever make it to a super how vindicating i guess in a way was it to see that for for pete and those guys to have the season that they did? i think it i think it really meant a lot uh to not only pete and his staff those players you know so many of those players last year after last year's uh, season could have gone in in the draft and and tried to play at the next level, but made a commitment to come back because uh, I think they felt they were a good enough team to a get in the tournament and then make a run. Um, and they didn't. And I think there was a lot of frustration and and you know kind of a missed opportunities. And so I think this year you saw it a little bit kind of in the middle of the season and probably that April May time frame while they struggled a little bit. I think they started to put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, because that's really what they wanted to do. And then when they got in the regional, you could just tell they, they just relaxed and had fun. And, you know, they hit the ball and they made plays. And, you know, they went down to Arkansas and beat Arkansas in their home field, which is an unbelievable environment. Um, and they made it to the Super Regional. So just very, very proud of them and, and Pete for them to stick with it, stick with the plan and, and believe in the plan. And, you know, a lot of them all have an opportunity to play at a high level. There were some great, uh, great baseball players that had a lot of success and, you know, a lot of those guys wish him the best, but I think there's, I think he's built a foundation here to to build upon. And now, when you get in the tournament and you make a run like that, the, the unfortunately, the the selection committee kind of looks at you a little differently all of a sudden. And if all of a sudden you have a season like we did two years ago, you're probably going to get it just because of like reputation. So, just really proud of how they competed this year. It's been a lot of fun. When you look back at the last two years, like the last two full athletic seasons, I mean, you've had Big Twelve championship. You've had a Sugar Bowl, you've had an Elite Eight, you've had a Super Regional now in baseball, women's basketball team hosting tournament games, got up as high as number two in the country this past year. Do you have a chance to to step back and kind of look at this and just admire everything that's that's been accomplished by your athletic department the last few years? Yeah, we, you know, I, I tell my staff that all the time. Sometimes we, we get so into the weeds of, you know, just operating an athletic program and whether it's your department or whatever the case may be that you kind of forget about, you kind of so to speak, stop it and smell the roses a little bit. And I think we have to remind ourselves to do that. And, 
you know, I was able to do that a little bit during the baseball tournament just because it was kind of at the end of the end of the you know, academic year, end of the season, and just literally just sitting there and being around the team and sitting there watching baseball for, you know, nine innings every day for, you know, several days. Just you kind of just relax and you do. You do just soak it all in and enjoy every minute of it. On the basketball front, I know a lot of people are really excited about the the transfer portal hall that uh, Jerome Tang and company have been able to put together. Uh, how how involved are you like in that process, and and how excited are you for what they were able to get done there? Well, you know, I I think it's just such a new world for everybody. Uh, even though it's been going on for a couple of years, it's just really ramped up. You know, last year and this year. Um, you know, I'm involved only in just you know checking in with Jerome and seeing where they are and. You know, how, how is he doing and what's, you know, how does he feel about the, the folks that he's talking to and, and what the, you know, what the market is, so to speak, because it is a market now. Um, and then making sure that he's comfortable with, you know, you bring in that many new players, you know, how are they going to fit? How are they going to fit as a group? And I think he's learned a little bit about, you know, that first year he came in and, and you know, you because some of the guys he got were, you know, he had two players, really. And he brought in a team that made it to the lead eight, I think. Last year, I'm not sure he had quite the makeup of the team that he wanted as a complete team in terms of working together, and and so I think he I think he's learned from that, and he's trying to build that kind of team that he had two years ago. The guys that really want to play together and, and be you know part of something a little bit bigger. And I haven't met them all, but uh, I've seen them working out, and they they seem to be working really hard. And um, you know, yeah, I think he's really excited. The staff's really excited about this team that they, they put together. There's a ton of talent there, obviously, and as you alluded to, I mean. It's not cheap. Same on the football side. You know, I mean, we saw like Dylan Edwards come in. They, they've been able to obviously maintain Avery Johnson, a lot of the pieces there on that team. How impressive has just the donor step up in here and making sure that, that they're keeping K-State competitive at a time right now where it is, I mean, little little wild, wild west-ish with, with how exactly you have to do that. You know, it was, it was interesting. I've been thinking about that a little bit, John, just, uh, you know, how we got to where we are and you know, early on, we had some donors that were really interested in this whole NIL thing and how it was going to work. And, you know, we're very, very curious about, you know, how we were going to approach it as a department and, you know, what role they could play. And, you know, if you remember initially, we were 100% hands off, right? We couldn't do anything. And as the NCAA began to kind of, you know, relax a little bit, and as we kind of rolled through those first couple of, you know, few several months and the NCAA said, hey, well, Maybe we do want a little bit more involved and a little bit more involved with the collectives to try to keep them under control. And um, as we were able to get out to the donors and tell a pretty consistent story about the need for both NIL dollars and, and operational dollars and how it was important to K State to stay competitive, they really listened and bought in. And we had multiple conversations, both in small groups with individuals and even in larger groups. And, uh, you know, again, just like any other. <laughs> I guess, campaign that we have. And this really wasn't a campaign necessarily, but, you know, their donors believe in what we try to do here and, and they and they support it at a high level and they've been able to do it again this time. And, you know, it's it's I worry about how much pressure we are putting on our donors as we continue through this process. But, again, very, very lucky to have the donors we have to get us to where we are. If people will, will talk and ask questions about, like, donor fatigue being something that could come in here, as you not only – look at your situation, but talk to other folks around the Big 12 and across the country. How much do you foresee that becoming a problem if this continues the way that it's going right now? Well, it's certainly a concern, you know, and I think it's just, and it's not just um, with NIL. I mean, obviously, you look around the country, you know, many of us have built tremendous facilities we have here on, on the backs of our donors and, and significant contributions. And, you know, fortunately, we have them to, you know, now for us, again, we're not going after them again in the, in the near future for a major capital campaign for facilities where a lot of a lot of schools are in the middle of a capital campaign or uh, or they're, re- they're looking at some other needs that they have. And so they're not only asking them for major capital projects for facilities, they're also asking them for NIL dollars or maybe even to support this, um, you know, the settlement in terms of revenue sharing. You know, for us, we can, you know, kind of begin to shift. We we shifted from, you know, facilities to NIL, and now we may have to shift to NIL slash revenue sharing. So, but it is a concern. Um, you know, donors are going to say at some point, whoa, what, you know, what? how much more do we have to give? Um, now, again, they also love being successful, right? And if, 
Uh, they love winning teams. They love conference championships. They love being competitive. And, you know, if we can't be competitive, then, then it, I think their frustration would rise even higher. So I, I think they, you know, we want to continue to fill the bill and, and fill Bramlage and all our venues and, and have successful teams. And I, I think we have the coaching staffs that can do that. And we have the facilities that can do that. And we just, you know, continue to tell the story of the donors and hopefully they'll stick with us. All right, guys, just because Cole and DY aren't here doesn't mean that I can't still tell you about our great friends at Home Field Apparel. They can just give all the gear to me, you know, give me three of the K-State shooting shirts. Uh, make sure you get to homefieldapparel.com and check out all the awesome K-State gear that they have there. 50 plus designs, all sorts of really cool retro stuff. It's You're seeing it all over Bill Snyder Family Stadium and Bramlage Coliseum, Toynton Family Stadium, wherever you're watching K-State Sports, man, people are wearing home field apparel all over the place. Uh, definitely on Twitter if you're there. Very active presence there. We're trying to get you into the gear that everybody is wearing these days, and we'll even give you 15% off your first order using promo code 3 mod 23 if you go to uh, homefieldapparel.com right now. If you want to be a trader like Derek, too, uh, they've got 100-plus other teams, and uh, you can grab some shirts there, maybe for your friends who root for other schools, okay? Promo code 3 mon 23 for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. kcsn.substack.com. Well, one sign that that you guys are on the right track to doing that is the fact that, you know, coaching carousel season in both sports can be a little little nerve-wracking. Certainly it was, I think, for a lot of us as fans, particularly in this past basketball coaching cycle. You know, there were plenty of reports out there about jobs that were interested in in Coach Tang. Uh, just take me through what, what that whole process was like from your perspective as he was kind of being courted by by some other jobs there during the offseason. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've asked our coaches to do with me, and I think I have a pretty good relationship with them, is to always just really be upfront with me when, when somebody's really serious about them, or a they're or b they're really serious about a job. Um, you know, and and there's been uh, there's always a lot of rumors, whether it's Chris or or Jerome or whoever, um, and a lot of them are true. And, and coach will come in to me like there was a couple of years ago after the Big Twelve Championship uh, in football. You know, Chris's name was floated for a lot, and he didn't come in to me on any of them, and eventually he did. Um, and in the same way with Jerome, a lot of rumors about it. He never came to me, and he finally came to me. He said, Gene, I was actually in um, in Phoenix during the Final Four run, and he called me and said, Gene, I, I think I need to look at this. And I said, okay. Um, and so while he was looking at it, then we you know, kind of put the head, my heads together with some of our uh, senior staff members and said, okay, what do we need to do? And so while he was talking to them, I was talking to his representatives and just figuring out what was, um, you know, what was a fair thing to do. We'd obviously just extended him the year before, and we wanted to not be crazy, but yet be competitive. We knew kind of where, at the time, where Arkansas's market was, and it really wasn't what, you know, what they ultimately ended up doing with Calipari. But it was a number a little bit higher than ours and something we felt we could get to, and and I don't think he really wanted to leave, and I don't think he was doing it for that reason. Um, but I, I think he just felt that was an opportunity for him to look at it. And so while he was meeting with them, I was meeting with his representatives, and I was you know, reaching out to some of our folks that understand the business a little bit. We ultimately came in with an offer, and they accepted it. And I, I believe they were very serious. I don't know if there was actual, an actual offer given to him from Arkansas. I later did see their athletic director, to be honest with you, at uh, at the baseball tournament, and we kind of joked about it, but we didn't go any other than just joking about it, so to speak. So uh, I'll, I'll never know, but I'm just glad that he's here, and I was very pleased that we could we could keep him here. If you ask Arkansas Twitter, Gene, I mean, there was never an offer, okay? No offer. They didn't get turned <laughs> down, nothing like that. Um, it, is there a formal contract that will be announced or like an extension or addition to the contract that will be announced at some point? Yeah, typically for an extension like that, when it's already been out there about kind of the details that are already there, we don't typically do an announcement. Um, we just, you know, if somebody calls and asks for, hey, can I, you know, open records, that obviously that's, we have to oblige by that. But in this case, I talked to Kenny Lanou and some of his staff, and most of the details were already correct and in the 
in the public domain, so we didn't feel like we needed to make an announcement. Uh, but if somebody were to ask and say, hey, you know, we want to see it, we certainly would provide that. But if it was, it was, um, you know, it was a major deal and we kind of kept it under wraps, we'd probably announce it. But it was so public during the time, felt that it was already, the information was out there, the information was correct, so we didn't choose to make an announcement. Yeah. Well, kind of along the lines of all of this, like big picture decisions that you're having to make right now, one of those I know and I'm sure it didn't come lightly, was the decision to take the Iowa State game, move it to Ireland to play at the beginning of next season, which obviously really cool opportunity for everybody there and a great spotlight opportunity in week zero for the college football world to uh, to watch K-State. Take me through that decision-making process and what all had to go into, you know, maybe where the genesis of that idea was and, and how that got to the finish line to actually making it happen. Yeah, you know, it was a... a, a, a a difficult decision for a lot of reasons, just because of the magnitude of that game. And, you know, this year in the 24 season, we're only going to have six home games for the first time in a long time. And we prefer to have seven, um, you know, obviously having Iowa state at home was big, but John Anthony is a, a guy that I've known in the business for many, many years. And they're the main company behind this game. They sponsored it uh, along with Air Lingus and, folks in Ireland for a number of years. And he's been asking me about, would you ever, would you ever consider, would you ever? You know, I always looked at some of the non-conference games and just never felt they were a big enough draw for us to go. And just wasn't sure that Chris would ever really consider that kind of, you know, effort. to. And it's not, it is an effort on a team. Well, then John kind of brought up the idea of an Iowa State game. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I'd never really thought about a conference game moving it to week zero. So I said, well, let me just ask Chris before we go too far down the path. And, you know, so John had sent me some information about some of the other teams that have gone out there. And so I sat down with Chris, and he was intrigued. And then he looked at some of the information, and he called actually some of the coaches that had played in that game that he knew. And they told him, they said, best experience we've ever had. He goes, if I, you know, it's one of the coaches even told him, if I could do it every year, I'd do it every year. Um so he bought it, and then we started just the process of before we even again got into a formal contract conversations about the Big Twelve. Could we move? It? What would it take? You know, ask the TV partners, and all that stuff had to be really pretty well approved, so to speak, before we could even get into the details. And then once they put some information in front of us about how the game would be played and the contracts, uh, it was a pretty good deal, to be honest with you. you know, very few. Expenses they would cover a majority, if not probably about ninety percent of our expenses plus some guarantee money. Um, you know, it still was a big decision, but again, I think it was one of those once in a maybe lifetime for some of these kids. Um, Iowa State was on board. There seemed to be a lot of fan excitement once we announced it, and um, you know, it's probably something we won't do for for many many years. It was it was it tough at all to get Iowa State on board with that. No, for them, really, it wasn't just because, you know, it was uh, going to be a road game for them anyway. Right. And and they, you know, their expenses are going to be covered, and they weren't looking for anything more than that. And, and so they were, you know, Jamie was pretty on board, and their coach is pretty on board as well. All right, well, now, unfortunately, we transition to the stuff that's a little <laughs> tougher here. Uh, you mentioned the, the house settlement. Um, the house versus NCAA, I mean, for those who aren't, quite as familiar here obviously that's the big case over nil class action lawsuit a part of that's going to be basically nil back pay but the the part that everyone's focused on now is huge part of the agreement would be revenue sharing moving forward with with the student athletes which is going to be it sounds like reports now around 22 million dollars at least to start that would have to be shared if you if you want to go all the way up to that which basically that'll kind of be like your your ticket to get in if you want to play with the big boys in college athletics anymore will be to pay $22 million back to the student athletes. Yes, I know a ton has happened with that, and I'm sure there are a ton of ways this could go, but what does it mean for K-State that, that you have that now and you have this sitting in front of Big 12 schools who are looking at quite a gap between them and the Big 10 and the SEC, and now you have to foot the bill for that moving forward pretty quickly here, too. Like, this will yeah. come up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah um, the, the, the challenge right now for all of us, and again, I mentioned we were at our national convention and many of us, you know, there were panels about it and the ADs on panels. I was on a panel. Um, then after the panels, you're sitting around either one-on-one -on -one with a colleague or 
Matter of fact, the one day we were in a group and there was about eight or nine athletic directors at the, at the power four level just end up sitting at the table and just, you know, talking about this, right? Um, and there are so many questions that we just don't have answers for um, that I won't say it's frustrating, but it's just, it's coming at us pretty quickly. And when we ask the questions and we've been on multiple calls with multiple attorneys and, you know, I'm on a little small committee right now at the Big 12 to just kind of go through the settlement and say, okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? Uh, is this a conference-wide decision? Uh, is it an institutional decision? What can and what can't we do? And, and there are so many unanswered questions other than, yeah, there's a number out there of 20 to 22 million. Okay, what what's that number based on? We kind of have a general sense of, you know, what dollars are that's going to, but how did they come up with that dollar? understanding is it's based on the average power five gross revenues um well okay what what you know everybody counts their revenues differently if you look at the ad report which is an annual report we have to give the nca everybody counts their revenues very differently so we're trying to get a handle on all that the biggest question is do we share it equitably amongst our athletes and conform with title nine or is it a true revenue share and the sports that make most of the revenue, which would be football and basketballs, get a majority of the revenue share. And then what does that put us in as position as an institution? If we do that, are we facing a Title IX lawsuit? If we go to the equal share or revenue, if we do it equitably, then are we facing some other kind of lawsuit from some of the athletes that generate a majority of the revenue? And we don't have answers for that right now. Um, we, we kind of know a number that we're working towards and figuring out how we're going to get there. Um, we, we obviously have the NIL. We know that's in today's NIL world really can't be the same uh, based on the settlement language from our understanding is individual donors cannot give to a third party for pay for play. Um, you can still have a corporate true NIL deal um, and that's still allowable. But will the collectives be able to stay ma maintain and can we continue to ask the donors to give to a collective and to give to athletics to help support the the revenue sharing? I don't think we can. So those are things we're still working through. We're, you know, we're going to sit down this summer here and just brainstorm of ways to generate more revenue. You know, there's this equity funding that people talk about. Um, across the country, there's beginning to be a very new phenomenon, with, at least at the collegiate level. Um, does that make sense? You know, is it is it a risky proposition to take on on that? I don't know. Uh, we're you know we're certainly going to look into it and and see what it would mean for K State. So we have to consider all sources. And you know, when I hear one of the highest revenue institution athletic directors at this level sit in a room full of his colleagues and say, we have to operate differently. We have to consider tearing sports. We have to consider university assistance, um, that they've never had those conversations. Then you sit back and go, okay, wow, this just isn't a K-State issue. It's, it's across the country issue because, you know, um, not to get too long winded, but we all freaked out when we were going to have cost of attendance. Oh my goodness. We're not going to afford that. And then we had the Alston case. Oh, my goodness, we're not going to be able to afford that. Then we said, oh, we can feed it whenever. Oh, my goodness, we can't afford that. And well, those costs were like a million dollars, a couple million dollars. Again, that's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But at this amount of revenue, we've found a way to figure it out, right? All of a sudden, you plop 20 or $22 million on any budget that's basically paying for everything that comes, everything that comes in is going out. Uh, that's a big number, no matter where what school you are. And so trying to figure that out is where we are. But they're just right now, there are so many unanswered questions that we're just still working through it. But, you know, for us, we have to comply. We're, we're, part, of the, we're part of the lawsuit. If we don't comply, then we're obviously <laughs> going to be in big trouble. And, but what level do we, do we have an option to not go to 22%, you know, of the revenue? Well, if we don't, is that going to be recruiting disadvantage? All of those things are, you know, still part of the conversation right now. As a golfer for years, I've been hearing PXG say nobody makes golf clubs like they do, period, 
know what? They're right. I went in for a fitting and saw for myself. I went in and swung the PXG Black Ops driver. Total game changer. No longer have to sacrifice distance for forgiveness. The world-class team of PXG experts will analyze every aspect of your swing when you go in for a custom fitting with every club, give you feedback in real time on how to improve, and you can look over at all the data and the analytics as you are taking practice swings and hitting balls into the mat in front of you, seeing where your shot is going and seeing the loft, the velocity on your shot, the distance that it traveled, the angle that you hit it. Did you have a draw? Did you have a hook? Did you have a slice? Uh, How are you hitting the ball? How solid a contact are you making? All that data is readily available on the computer screen right there as they get you custom fitted and watch you hit shots and then adjust the golf club, adjust the driver, adjust the head of the shaft or the, the, excuse me, the head of the driver and the weight distribution of it and the angle of it, et cetera. All the details that they go into to adjust it and customize it specific to match your swing uh, to help fix where the ball is going. For me, it was going to the right a lot and slicing and uh, they got it adjusted and by the last 10 to 15 shots i was hitting the ball straight making solid contact and now i have my very own pxg black ops driver that has been a total game changer for me and can't wait to get out on the golf course and use it more pxg made me a believer they'll do the same for every golfer in kansas city visit pxg.com slash stream all to schedule your fitting at pxg kansas city 7517 west 119th street in overland park Get fitted for any club and you'll get a dozen golf balls free. That's pxg.com slash three maw to schedule your fitting. Limit of one dozen golf balls per per person. Promotion ends June 30th. Other terms and conditions may apply. See store for details. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. Yeah, you know, I mean, I have so many follow up questions here, but the, you know, the, the one to me, like it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but like the best case scenario, if you're a Big 12 school here and you're, you're not making the money on the TV contracts that the Big Ten or the SEC are. I mean, theoretically, the best case scenario is everybody just has the $22 million revenue sharing number and there's less that you can do, as you mentioned, with the collectives outside of that. So theoretically, you could be on a more level playing field if it gets there. Like, I, how how realistic is that, that there wouldn't be as much that you could do outside of that $22 million number? And if you could find a way to hit it, whether it's through private equity or whatever it's going to be, that you could still be pretty competitive with with Big Ten and SEC schools. I mean, I think I think uh, it, it can be. You know, um, you know, it's it's all relative, right? Like right now, you know, Ohio State's budget is two hundred and fifty sixty million. And, um, you know, but they also have almost forty sports that they sponsor. Um, you know, Texas's budget's so well over two hundred million. Well, we've been competitive with them for a long time, but we all have to add. Just twenty million dollars. Just use twenty million. We all have to add that, right? Um, and find the money for it. And once we do, then I think we still sell what we sell, which is great facilities and, and, and a consistent competitive program and record of success and record of championships. And you know, all of a sudden, but you know, for our athletes to come here and we, if we can't say we are going to be part of the revenue sharing, then you know they're going to look at me and go, well, but you know, there's still programs um you know they all have to meet this and 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 so i i think we'll figure a way out of it it's gonna be a bigger challenge we've ever faced before and i think when i sit in the room with some really really smart athletic directors and they are saying the same thing um it's it's a pretty consistent conversation across the country well it seems to me like from the reports that we saw with what Ray Yormark is putting in front of you guys, whether it is private equity or private capital, whatever you want to call it. I know some people will dispute which one that should be talked about, but if you missed the reports last week, they were out there that Big 12 would consider giving up 15 to 20% of the conference for $800 million to a $1 billion in terms of just cash coming in from the private equity source, uh, CVC, the, the company there, and then also the naming rights uh, deal where you could get 30 to $50 million per year. I mean, it seems like the attitude is like, we're not going to back down. We're not going to just bow down and become like a minor league to the the SEC and the Big Ten right now. Is that is that a fair assessment of where you feel like people are at in the league right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get into, you know, some of those other things um, with the conference. There's, there's still a lot of, you know, stuff out there. But, 
I think as a conference, we, we need to stay aggressive. And I think that's what Brett has come in and done um, from the minute he got here, whether it was, you know, going out and, and getting the four corner schools to, you know, looking at different things that are championships and, you know, halftime shows and um, game sponsorships are, you know, a little new, newer wave. And just, you know, a lot of stuff that he's been bringing to all of us has been way outside the box for us in the collegiate market. He's brought, you know, really kind of the professional NBA attitude. And, and I think we all feel like, yeah, we've got to get outside the box, whether it's institutionally, how we think, or as a conference, and, and then being aggressive as we possibly can be um, in order to, in order to you know, they do have more revenue with some of their TV packages. And, and I think Brett feels very, very confident that with the addition of, where we are with the 16 schools that yeah, right now our TV deal is what it is. Uh, but he feels that the upside of our next deal could be much bigger. And he believes in that. And he's, you know, he's kind of buying into that. And I think the people he talks to in the industry truly believe that as well. So um, yeah, I think we all have to really be aggressive and, and stay the relevance, the right word. I don't know if relevance is the right word, because I think as a conference we're very relevant, particularly in some of our sports, um, but we just have to stay uh, nationally competitive. So what, this is another technical question that maybe is impossible to answer right now, but what, how does the role of Wildcat NIL change then in this new, this new future and where things will be going with, with revenue sharing? Uh, you know, fair question. And, and it's something that we don't know yet. We, we actually are going to meet with them here and then continue to look at that and see what that role is. Uh, for right now, it'll stay the same just because, you know, we're still using NIL dollars and, and they're very active and they're very good. They've been very good at what they've done. Uh, they've been, they're organized. They've, they've put together a, a great program, both from a, a ground level and a, you know, you know, not only from getting donors for big numbers, but just creating opportunities for everybody to participate. And I think that's been, yeah, that's one of the reasons we chose one, one collective, right? Um, so I think we just have to figure that out and figure out what uh, you know what what role they will play, um, and and it's something we'll continue to talk to them about. A couple fun ones to uh, to finish here. This okay. is an easy one. You guys have a, a football team that's projected by many to be one of the top two contenders for the Big Twelve title this year. A lot of excitement with all the talent that's there. Just uh, what do you, what are you seeing right now from the guys when you've been around them and spring practice, all that workouts that are going on this summer. What's the vibe around the football program? You know, a lot of excitement. Um, and they look like they're having a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of new faces that, uh, you know, not so much from the transfer portal, but just younger guys that, you know, are getting opportunity to step up. You know, many of them we saw in the bowl game last year. Um, I think there's, you know, very quiet confidence about them um, in terms of what they might have the potential to do. But there's not an overconfidence at all, and they know they've got a lot of work to do between now and even before August starts. So, um, but there's a general excitement. I, I get a sense from both coaching staffs and 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 the team themselves. Uh, are you going to be in Vegas for Big Twelve Media Days? I am. I am. Are you are you a Vegas guy? Like, what are you looking forward to most about the? <laughs> you know, I was just in Vegas for a national convention and. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a gambler, so I, I don't go out there and, 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 you know, put money down. I do enjoy the, just the glitz and glamour of Vegas, but, um, more than a couple of days is plenty for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough. I'm, I'm not really much of a Vegas guy myself, <laughs> either, but, uh, well, we look forward to seeing you out there. I, if you can answer this question, I was thinking about this, like, you know, what, what does Brett Yormark do when he's out there in Vegas? Like, what what is Brett Yormark's like drink of choice? Have you have you seen Brett Yormark drink? Is he like a wine guy? Yeah, you know he's not a big drink guy. I'll be honest with you. Uh, he's going 100 miles an hour from the minute. He's, what you see is what you get. Whether it's you know midnight or the guys always think it's all. But I think when I do see him, it's a maybe maybe a half a glass of red wine. But I've never seen him drink a drink. He's more of a He's got to go. He's got things to do. So, uh, but he's more, if I see him do anything, it's usually like a little bit of red wine. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. He's, he's got a lot on his plate too. Yeah. Uh, right now for sure. Absolutely. Well, Gene, thanks for taking so much time. Really great to catch up with you. Yeah, uh, best of luck with everything moving forward and hope to see you out in Vegas. All right. Thanks. Good to see you, John.